Okay, this Hangout on Air is live. This is our help session. It's October 1st in some parts of the world, October 2nd in other parts of the world. And uh, we don't have anyone that's joined just yet, but we'll give folks a couple of minutes. One question that I did get via email is, could we cover normalization? And I think I would like to talk about normalization a little bit. So um, I don't have, at least I don't know how yet, the ability to route the sound from my computer into the Hangout just yet. I think I need to use, uh, I tried to use Audio Hijack Pro, but I didn't see a way to do it with that. So I also have uh, an app that came with my audio interface from Focusrite called Sapphire Mix Control. And there is a loopback function. I'm not sure how it works, but we may try that today as well. So in fact, let's try it right now. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the loop back on. We're going to get uh, DA1 and DA2. Now the question is, when I take Adobe Audition here, which I have open, and I need to make the window smaller. Okay. When I have Adobe Audition here, let me play through some of this audio and see what happens. No, we're not getting the audio. So that does not appear to work. Well, we'll just have to show that visually for now. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, all right. I am going to share my audition instance here. Share. Okay, there we go. Make that bigger. Hopefully you can see that all right. Looks like you probably can. Okay. So this is just some audio, uh, an audio track that we have, a mono audio track dialogue from the episode actually that I put up on YouTube last night. This is what it looks like straight out of the recorder here. I'm just going to cut this noise off up front. Here at the start, I have, whoops, let's get back over. These are the hand claps that I did to sync up the audio later on. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and first of all, you can see that sticks way out. Um, this one almost hits minus one dB. So the first thing I need to do is shrink that down. I don't want that overwhelming everything else. And besides that's gonna get cut eventually. So I just highlight that. And we're just gonna pull that down so those waveforms are in line with all the rest here. That's good enough there. Okay. So uh, the next thing that I will do typically to normalize this. Um, there are a couple of ways you can go about this and I'm I'm going to show you how I typically do it, but I'm going to show you some ways that don't require software that's quite as expensive. So, so for example, right now, um, I have, I have um, let's see, you can see a couple of things. I have a couple of problems I need to solve. First of all, the waveforms uh, we have a lot of transients here that that stick way up. So to get the normal to get the audio normalized and loud and present, I'm going to need to first of all probably compress some of those. But also, you'll notice that the waveform there there tends to be a lot more waveform up above the infinity line versus below. So normally people think, oh, that's DC offset. Let me just scan this uh, little track here and let's see if we have any DC offset. We have virtually none, 0.01%. So it's not really a DC offset issue. It's actually what I would call asymmetric waveform. So we've got more up on top than on bottom. That in and of itself is not a problem. The, the reason I like to fix that if I can, and Adobe Audition does not have a built-in tool to do that, I like to fix that because then it gives me more headroom to make the, the audio more, again, more present and to normalize it properly. So. Let me just show you kind of the more expensive way I do it, and then I'll show you a way you can do it with just Adobe Audition or even with Audacity. So first of all, what I do is I actually transfer this over to RX4. Uh, and I just remembered, I'm not sure this will carry over in the screen share. Let me just see if it will. We're going to stop screen sharing that. And we're going to start screen sharing this. 
Okay, there we go. There's RX4. All right, RX4 has uh, in this channel ops module over here something called adaptive phase rotation. Again, if you look at the waveform, you can see more of it's on top than on bottom. I'm going to go ahead and fix that, just applying this adaptive phase rotation and watch what happens to the waveform here. Boom. Now I have equal amounts of headroom on the top and the bottom. So, uh, you know, if you're getting really particular about this, that's one thing you can do. Uh, again, I understand not everyone can afford RX4 Advanced, but I just want to kind of run through my process. And then again, we'll come back and do a more simplified process. If I needed to do any sort of noise reduction, I actually would have done that first. So here again in, in RX4 Advanced, there's this very nice dialog denoiser. Uh, it's, it just works so automatically. The default settings almost always work. You can just go ahead and apply that. And you'll watch, if you watch right here in the silent part, you'll see that shrink. And it has taken care of a good bit of that noise. I like to do that first and then apply the phase rotation. So again, this will straighten things up so that we have the same amount of headroom on the top and the bottom. See how it did the waveform. So now this is peaking at minus nine and this is also peaking at minus nine. Okay, from there, I'll come into my loudness module. Now, uh, this will change. The version of Audition that's coming out later this year will have a true peak limiter. The current version, Adobe Audition CC 2015.0, I think it is, does not have the true peak limiter. But uh, again, coming this fall, later on this fall, it will. So you will be able to do that or do what I'm about to do here in Adobe Audition. You won't need RX4. So that's a great thing. What I'm looking for here is eventually I'm going to want to get my integrated LKFS or LUFS or the same thing. Uh, for a mono file, I'm going to want to get that to about minus 19. LUFS. Right now we're at minus 31, so we have a long way to go. So the first thing I do is take this to minus 24 because then I, it's a little bit, you know, the waveforms are a little more prominent. It's easier for me to see what I'm doing when I use the compressor. Okay. So you can see our waveforms are bigger here. Now I'll pull up my compressor. And what I want to do is I want to take these, these peaks here and manage them in pull them in a little bit closer to the rest of the waveforms. So that way I can normalize even louder and we'll get again, that very clean, clear, present dialogue sound. So I'm probably going to compress down to, I think minus 12 is about right. And I have this all kind of set up right here. These are our settings for the compressor here. So I'm gonna use a three to one ratio, a minus 12 threshold. So anything above minus 12 is gonna get compressed by three to one. So every three dB, Above minus 12, we, it will be kind of compressed down to 1 dB above 12. Um, we'll attack very quickly, 1 millisecond, and then release after 150 milliseconds. This tends, these two settings tend to work really well for dialogue in most cases. And then I'm also using a soft knee. That'll just sort of give it a gentler effect. It'll actually start kicking in a little bit lower, but it won't apply the full effect until it gets to minus 12. So let's process that. And you can see it's definitely brought those peaks in a lot closer to where we were. So we'll go back to our loudness module. It's calculating to see where we're at. Okay, we're now at minus 26.1 and our true peak is at minus 6.8. So again, my target, I wanted to be at minus about 19, I'll say 19.5 in this case. I wanna keep my true peak at minus 1.5. So I'll go ahead and process that and let's see what happens here. This is sometimes an iterative process, meaning you may have to do it a few different times. You may have to back up a step and say, okay, those settings I used last time weren't quite right. Let's back up a little bit and see what happens here. So what I'm looking to do here again is to get everything nice and loud without chopping off the tops of the waveforms too much. And that actually looks pretty good. I wish I could play it for you here. I still got to figure out how to do that, um, but that's what it looks like. So I'll just send that back to Adobe Audition. And I think I need to show that to you here one second while I switch back over. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing that and start sharing this. Okay, so to bring that back over, I just come back in to, whoops. There we go. Now that brings it back into Audition. Okay. So there are, there's our normalized waveform. 
What I typically do as well is I will actually convert it to stereo from there just because it's easier to bring it into Final Cut Pro that way. I don't know why Final Cut doesn't handle mono dialogue very well. Or at least I haven't figured out how to do it. So I convert it to stereo. I like to come over here into Amplitude Statistics. That's this panel here. If you don't have it, you just go to Window Amplitude Statistics and give that a scan. And you can see our true peak amplitude is minus 1.52. So we're good there. We always want to be minus 1.5 or lower. And then our overall LUFS is minus 16.6. So that's exactly where I like to get it for, for normalizing a dialogue audio track. For distribution, I should say very specifically for distribution on the web. Now you'll notice before when we were over in RX4 Advanced, that was minus 19 uh, or 19 and change, I think 19.5. And when we converted it to stereo, the, uh, the equivalent in stereo terms is minus 16. So those are rough, those are equivalent in it from an auto, audible standpoint. Um, so don't get confused by that. So minus 16 for stereo files, minus 19 for uh, mono files. And again, this is for distribution on web. If you're actually going to broadcast for TV or for you know a movie that's gonna screen in a, th a proper theater, um, you would actually use different uh, loudness targets. In fact, typically, so for example, if I were going for, uh, in the United States, the target is usually minus 24 LUFS for television broadcast in Europe. It is minus 23. Uh, so those are the kind of targets you're aiming for. But again, for the web, um, the recommendation for many people, for, well, there's no, there's no official standard, but the recommendation is typically minus 16 for stereo minus 19 for mono, which again are the same thing. So that's that's the kind of more sophisticated process that I've been using. Let me just back up this file a little bit. Not gonna save it, we're gonna bring it back in. Let me show you what I would do if I didn't have RX4 Advanced. So again, I would still cut this off and let me just make sure I am showing all the right stuff here. Okay, yeah, it looks like it's still showing. Come back into audition. Okay. First of all, that's just noise before I actually sat down and started filming. So I'm going to cut that off. I would do the same thing here with the hand claps. Again, if you look at these waveforms, see how these are much more, much, uh, the peaks, the amplitude is much larger than all these others. So I just highlight that and pull them down. So they're kind of in line with the rest. I don't want them to stick out too much. All right, the next thing I would do is the compression. And you can do that right here by going to Effects, Amplitude and Compression, Single Band Compressor. And again, we'll do a similar thing. I think I want to go, see, here's the problem where we've got these asymmetric waveforms. We're probably going to end up compressing the top a lot more than the bottom. That's a little bit of a problem. So what we're going to do, let's set our threshold Actually, before we get do that, let's uh, bring this in here. We're going to, again, target minus 24 LUFS is kind of an intermediate step. You can see, actually, I'm going to want to back up from that because, look, it's already, we're already going to, we're getting awfully dangerously close to clipping. And in fact, it probably limited those peaks right there. So I'm going to undo that. Let's just go minus 26 for now. So I can see everything that I'm working on here. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna probably then, again, go for a threshold of minus 12 in my compressor. So I wanna compress everything that's above minus 12 or below minus 12 on this side. Uh, we used a three to one compression ratio, so we'll keep with that. And again, attack one millisecond, release 150 milliseconds, and I wanna leave my output gain at zero. Now, a couple of things. Again, I just, I just find that for most dialogue and a fast attack, because I'm trying to manage these transients here, these little peaks that stick way out that are not necessarily super audible because they happen so quickly, um, but they're kind of getting in the way of us being able to normalize the overall body of the waveform. Um, it's okay to use a very fast attack time. So I'm using one millisecond and then release 150 milliseconds, keeps it from pumping and making some strange artifacting types of noises. So we'll go ahead and apply that. And it's definitely managed it. Let's go ahead now and see if we can get into the minus 19.5 range here. 
So this is, again, this is the match volume panel. If you're not familiar with that or if you don't have it in Adobe Audition the way you have it set up, come up here to Window and choose Match Volume. And what you do is you just drag the file down into this space right here, and then you use these controls here to, to specify how much you want to normalize or what you want to normalize to. And in this case, we're normalizing to a, a loudness target of nine, minus 19.5 LUFS. So click Run. Okay, that actually looks okay, not bad. It's not like we're chopping off all these waveforms here. We do have one problem, though. We have um, let's see, somebody. Hey, Christian, thanks for joining us. Um, good, good. If if uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a mute for a couple minutes here, we'll be back for questions in just a second. All right, let's see here. So yeah, we're pretty good here. The last thing we need to do though is take care of these true, the true peak limiting. So if we come back to amplitude statistics, with this guy, and we just do a scan here, we're going to see that our true peak, true peak amplitude is minus 0.12 dB true peak. That's a problem. We, again, we need to be at minus 1.5 or less. So what we're going to do is come into effects, amplitude and compression. We're going to use the hard limiter. And I want to set the maximum amplitude to minus 1.5. We'll start there. We want the input boost zero because we don't want to boost the input at all. Um, our look ahead time, we just leave it the default, 100 milliseconds and release time, 100 milliseconds seems to work well. So we'll go ahead and click apply. You can see it's actually chopped off some of those waveforms. That's getting a little dicey, actually. I may want to come back, and I'm going to undo that uh, normalization and the compression. I need to do that compression over. We didn't compress quite aggressively enough, so we're going to come back in and do that again. I just did Control or sorry, Command Z or Control Z, depending on whether you're on Mac or PC. Um, we need to get that. Uh, compressed a little bit more aggressively. So I'm going to drop it to maybe minus, uh, let's go minus 14 this time. Do that or we could change our compression ratio. I don't typically like to go a lot beyond 3 to 1. Um, let's just see how this works this time if we drop it to minus 14 for our threshold. So we apply that. Looks like it compressed it a little bit more. We come back over here to our match volume settings, our match volume panel. We've already dragged the file in here, and we've set our loudness target to minus 19.5 LUFS. Click Run. Ah, I think we're doing a little better this time. Then we can come back up, get our amplitude and compression hard limiter. We've set the maximum amplitude to minus 1.5. Again, leave the other things at default. Well, actually, input boost to zero and the other two at default. Click Apply. And you can see we didn't chop off the waveforms nearly as much this time. So that's how I would do it if I didn't have um, RX4 advanced, uh, just in Adobe Audition. The, the downside of doing it this way, again, is that you can see these waveforms are still a little asymmetric. There's more amplitude over here on the top than there is on the bottom. Like these are peaking out at uh, even less than minus 3 dB, whereas these are all peaking at minus 1.5. So. It's a little lopsided. There's nothing audible. You'll hear about that. The only thing is, is that you can't, um, it just doesn't give you as much room to, to loudness normalize. You have to compress a little bit more aggressively to get it to fit in our parameters, which again are, because it's a mono file, we're aiming for about minus 19, 19.5 LUFS, and we want a true peak of minus 1.5. So that's how I do it. I just, again, I'd convert it there to stereo, which is just right click. Oops. Right click, convert sample type. Um, I recorded this at 48 kilohertz, so I'd leave it at 48,000 hertz, 48 kilohertz. I'm converting it to stereo, and I'm putting 100% in the left and right, and then I'm also leaving it at 24 bit, which is the same I recorded it at. So click OK. Makes it stereo. Now you'll notice when we come to the amplitude statistics, we have a problem. First of all, it's only showing one channel, so it's kind of a funny thing with Adobe Audition. You have to close that panel and reopen it, and then it comes in and it has a left and a right channel. We'll scan. You can now see our dB, our true peak amplitude is now minus 1.46. Now, 
Uh, that's probably not necessarily something you have to worry about, but if it was a little bit farther off, you probably would want to come back in here and go a little more aggressive on the limiter. Maybe drop it to minus 1.6. This is kind of an illustration of where a peak limiter and a true peak limiter are different. Um, and, and the way it works is this. Uh, let me go ahead and apply this and then I'll show you. So I'm going to go a little more aggressive, minus 1.6 dB on the limiter. Watch what happens when I zoom way in on these things. You're seeing the actual individual samples. So again, this, we, we're recording at 48,000 hertz. You're getting 48,000 of these little tiny samples per second. And the way true peak is different than peak is that between two of these samples, technically, it's possible for the waveform to extend above them and then come back down. So true peak actually measures where that waveform goes to in between samples, whereas a peak limiter only looks at the individual samples and doesn't account for any cases where this line may actually exceed um, the actual samples themselves. So it's kind of a strange, a strange little phenomenon that happens, but that's, it's important to get the true peak to minus 1.5 because if you don't, um, once you compress it or export your video and it gets into a compressed format, you can still have some clipping, some digital distortion that occurs. So that's why we're so particular about getting it to minus 1.46. So we went a little more aggressive there. Again, we limited to minus 1.6 dB. Let's scan this selection again. And you can see we're now at minus 1.55 dB true peak. So we're good now. So that's one thing you can do there. All right. So we'll call that, say stop sharing that. And let's get me back into, there we are, okay. All right, do we have any questions about that processor? That was what a request we got earlier today was, let's, uh, or actually not today, but it was actually a couple of days ago. Someone wanted to know a little bit more about how to normalize your audio. Here's, here's a big secret. I don't think a lot of people realize if you just record your audio, or when you're recording audio, as you've taken the course, you know you, you want to leave some headroom for yourself. So that's why I typically aim to have my peaks at minus 12 and not all the way up to 0 dB. And the reason, of course, you do that in case someone gets really loud, you have a little bit of room here where it can actually record that without clipping. Well, the problem is, is if you record such that your peaks are at minus 12, when you play it back, it doesn't, all seem, it doesn't seem all that prominent, and kind of present, and exactly how you necessarily want it to sound. And so that's why we do the normalization in post. And uh, I think a lot of people uh, on YouTube, a lot of people have come to me and said, hey, how come my audio isn't sounding awesome? I bought this really expensive microphone and I'm doing exactly what you say in terms of how to record it, but it doesn't sound awesome. Um, and I think that's, if you want awesome sound, you really do have to do some post-processing. So that's where we're at. All right. Let's see, we have a couple of you here. Bob, welcome back. Christian, it's good to see you both again this week. Thanks, Curtis. Uh, tell me, have you? Uh, what was your experience? Christian, I think you had a little gig over the weekend. How did things go? It's great to hear. So the, have you... Uh, have you finished it and, and passed it over to the? It was a comedy group, right? That was uh, that you were working with. Oh, okay. Very good. Good deal. So, it it uh, have they have you delivered the the audio to them yet? Have they given you any feedback or where are we at on that? Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Finally, a 
uh, like I say, I just trust you. Good deal. Good deal. Sounds like you're on your way, Christian. You <laughs> you got to got to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks so much. I got the last part of your part to take, but uh, it's been interesting listening to you. Whatever you're talking about is fantastic. Very so good. Go ahead. And keep on talking. Okay. <laughs> good deal. Bob, how's how's your uh, how have things been going for you? Um, they're going okay. Uh, I'm one of those fellows that will watch TV movies and then question how did they do that. The last one that that I had a question about was um, was watching on Crackle. Um, Jerry Seinfeld was interviewing um, Stephen Colbert, and in doing so, they were in a coffee shop. No lavalier scene, shooting from different angles and. I don't know if what type of a mic or where it was, if it was just out of the camera, but you could hear them extremely well and hear some of the conversation in the background, but not much. Mm -hmm. Any ideas on that? Well, it depends on the. Did, what were the? What was the framing on the camera like on that? Were they pretty tight on most of the camera angles, or did they pull back in some? Yeah, they were. They were. It was a combination. Okay. Um, but I still couldn't see any any of the uh, sound equipment, so I'm sitting there looking and, and scratching my head. How are they collecting what they want, but also blocking out the rest? Yeah, I, th I my guess is a couple of things, a couple of possibilities, and they probably had a couple of options available to them. That's typically going to be the case in my experience. Is they'll they probably had lavaliers. Um, hidden on the, the two of them if they were wearing like suits and ties. Uh, a very common place to hide a lavalier mic is right underneath the tie because you can actually sandwich it between the tie and the shirt and they typically uh, make a little triangle of gaffer's tape or some other type of two-sided tape. Um, attach that to the shirt, attach the lavalier to that and then get another little triangle of two-sided tape put that on top of the lavalier and then attach the tie to that. So it's kind of sandwiched in between. The nice thing about that is when they move around a little bit, if it's sandwiched like that, the tie is going to stay in place and you're not going to get a lot of the clothing rustling and movement noise. So I'm okay. guessing that's one thing they did. Secondly, a lot of times in those kind of situations they will plant mics as well. So they'll have a mic that's, that's actually within the frame but just not prominent so you can't see it. So, for example, if they had something on the table, I don't know if they had, you know, some condiments or something on the table in a cafe, they may have one of a mic hidden behind it, or maybe two mics even hidden behind those, uh, aimed at the at the uh, you know the two talent where you couldn't see it from the camera views, the different angles. Um, so that's one thing I've seen done as well. The the trick with those, though, if they if you know if they hit the table or they're touching the table a lot, you're going to start to hear that unless it's isolated from the table somehow. So. Um, that's that's a that's a likely scenario there. There are some things uh, I don't know how often this is done as well, but there are long shotgun mics. Most of us are accustomed to seeing and working with short shotgun mics, and a short shotgun mic is going to typically going to be in the 28 centimeter range, um, but a long shotgun mic is going to be much longer, and it can actually isolate sounds a little bit better, but it has to be aimed just right. <laughs> so they can actually back those up a little bit more and still get a very clean signal because again the pickup pattern on those is so small versus a short shotgun it's going to be more like this on a long shotgun it's going to be more like this so um, I know that for example uh, Rode makes an NTG8 which is a long shotgun mic uh, obviously Sankin uh, makes, a, makes one as well um, I believe that Sennheiser has at least one or two of them as well so that's another possibility I don't again I don't know exactly what they did in that case but those are a couple of possibilities that that uh, they could have been using there. Okay, the wife and daughter. Um, <clears throat> we did set up and, and try to use the NTG one and also the uh, Heil PR40. Mm -hmm. um, they're so close together that the um, the NTG will pick up both on one channel. So we've ordered a second PR40. To see if that'll um, allow it to go each on a track. Any any suggestions on how to make that NTG one 
limited in 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 turn it a different direction or stick it further back. Yeah, the closer you are, first of all, the tighter the pickup pattern will be on the person speaking, so you want to get as close as you can, which you're probably already doing. Secondly, you will want to have the, the two of them seated so that you can actually aim the NTG1 directly at one of them and that the other person will fall into the rejection zone on the side. So you want to probably you probably need to go to a little bit more of extreme of an angle because that that is one thing with the NTG mics that are sorry the NTG one two uh, three and four mics they're all short shotgun mics so their their pickup pattern is well it's you know it's going to be tighter than a cardioid mic it's it's still relatively large so you're going to have to kind of put them in at an extreme angle there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to answer my question. You betcha. Pleasure's mine. Keep us updated too. I'm really curious to to see where you guys end up landing. It sounds like you've the the PR40s could work really well too. I think in those in the case of those, if you're going to use two of those, um, that's again another case where you're going to have to keep them at a pretty extreme angle if you really want to kind of isolate each of the channels. And uh, it is advisable definitely to isolate the channels as much as you can because if you don't, then you're going to have a lot more post work where you're going to have to do ducking in the individual channels. So the person that's not speaking, all the bleed from the other person, you're going to have to pull that down and uh, and vice versa as they go back and forth in their dialogue. So best to, well, best to get it isolated. Well, one of the things I'm learning is is that it's trial and error. And sure. you've got to have enough time for setup to do it just right. So... Yeah, you're absolutely right. I completely agree with that. All right. Thanks again. You betcha, Bob. Thanks for coming by. Looking forward to hearing back from you. All right. Catch you next time. All right. Take Bye. care. All right. Let's check in and see if we have any questions in the queue. I don't see any questions in the queue. We do have two viewers right now. If you are viewing over at Google+, Plus. Uh, on the Hangouts on Air page. If you wanted to enter questions, you can enter those there and we'll see them here and be able to address those. Would love to do that if you have any that you're interested in hearing about. Um, in the meantime, let me talk about a couple of other things I've been working on as far as sound is concerned. Yesterday, if you may or may not have seen, but I posted another video on um, working with the Sennheiser AVX lavalier system. So you got that here. This is their digital wireless system. In this particular case, it's the one with the MKE2 lavalier microphone. And uh, these run about $1,000, so they're not cheap. It's, uh, I believe, Sennheiser's first foray into digital wireless. It's really designed for uh, videograph typically kind of run and gun videographers that don't have the luxury of having a sound guy with them. <laughs> And they're typically going to be using either a pro camcorder that has XLR inputs, or it also comes with an attachment to adapt the XLR out on the trans, or sorry, the receiver to a 3.5 millimeter input for a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. So it's kind of aimed at a different group. I don't think they're really designing this to be. Um, this is not replacing their G3 analog wireless system. It's a complement to it. And I think they're pretty clear about that in their marketing materials. So this is really great for people that don't have, again, time or, or the luxury of <laughs> managing audio. Um, it does a couple of things that's kind of interesting, and we'll get to that in a, in a final review I have coming up. But it does some also, um, it manages dynamic range. So rather than letting the loud parts get so loud that they clip, it actually manages that to some extent. And it's using, I believe, I'm not positive, but I believe it's using a compander, which is a combination of a comp compressor and expander. So it actually compresses the audio, sends it, and then expands it back. Um, but I think when it's expanding it back, whoops, sorry about that. When it's expanding it back, it's not expanding it all the way, so it prevents clipping. It doesn't work perfectly, but it actually works pretty nicely, and I could definitely understand if you're if you're running and gunning and you're a one-man show, um, this could be a pretty nice addition to your kit to make sure you get pretty decent audio uh, in that process. While I was testing that, though, um, I mentioned this, I think, last week. I bought some of these Rycote undercovers. I'd used these in the past, and these are for hiding lavalier microphones in various ways. It's It's got a couple of different things. Pull these out. Here you can see 
These are little adhesive tabs, I guess, or little dots that are two-sided, so they uh, have adhesive on both sides, and you first attach that to, you know, either the skin or under the shirt of the person that you're going to be miking, and then you have these little felt sort of dots. Um, I don't know if you can really see that here, but these are kind of pre-cut little dots that fit perfectly on those little tabs that you adhere, and the idea is here to prevent any sort of noise from clothing as they move because that's one of the biggest problems with hiding lavaliers is that it uh, has a tendency to, you know, as the clothing rubs against the microphone, you get all this interference and this horrible, horrible noise. And it doesn't, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so um, this was supposed to solve that problem. I don't find that you can just, for example, attach it underneath the shirt, put that felt on top of it and expect it to, to not have clothing noise. I still was getting plenty of clothing noise. So um, I think, you know, really what they sell this as is a microphone wind cover. So this is to prevent wind noise. You know, and again, you could, you could apply it on the outside of your shirt, I suppose, if you're okay with having it show. Um, and that would manage some of the wind, and that's what the felt is for, really. But I don't find that it's a perfect solution in terms of hiding the mic underneath the shirt. So... I'm still kind of exploring on different ways to hide lavalier mics. I don't feel like I've really mastered that art yet. And it's part of the reason why I'm not an, an enormous fan of lavaliers. They always, they're just really troublesome. And it's, it's hard to get them just right. But one of the next places I'm going to try is hiding a microphone underneath a collar. So if you do have talent that's wearing a collar, I think that could be a nice place to hide things. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the whole um, using a kind of a wound up triangle of tape and you use that to mash the microphone in between two layers of clothing or between, I'd say, a tie and a shirt or perhaps uh, between a shirt and a, a jacket, like a sport coat type thing. Um, those are all strategies that I have used that seem to work the best so far. Those are the ones that I found work the best. So um, we're still doing a little experimenting. I apologize that segment is taking a while to get up on the course. We're still working on it. And once I feel like <laughs> we have that technique working pretty well, we'll get that posted for you. So um, I did have a gig a couple of weeks ago, as I mentioned, that we did use lavaliers. The way the talent were moving, we just couldn't get the clothing noise to stop. So we ended up actually mounting the lavalier on the lapel of the jacket. And it, it was pretty well hidden. You couldn't necessarily, you could see it if you looked really closely, but we ended up resorting to that just so we could get the good you know, quality sound without the mic being too prominent, but also not entirely hidden. So that was kind of our compromise. And then the female talent, um, as I maybe mentioned before, she actually, we gave her the microphone, she went off and just gave her instructions on how to attach it to the kind of the strap in between the two cups on her bra behind the strap so that it was kind of um, protected from clothing rubbing against it. And that worked really well. Her microphone worked really, really nicely. So that was kind of the lesson learned there. So there are a couple things for you to try as far as hiding lavalier microphones. Uh, let's see, we covered normalization a little bit earlier. Um, and again, it looks like we had a couple more, maybe three more people join uh, on the live session. If you are over on YouTube, you may want to come over to Google+. Plus. That's plus.google.com, and then look for me, Curtis Judd. And if you, if you join from there, you can actually submit questions, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Let's see, um, other projects that I'm working on related to sound, I, uh, uh, probably a month ago now, we reviewed a microphone from a company called Asden. That It was a shotgun microphone, the SGM250, and it was a pretty nice little shotgun mic. It's about a $250 mic. <laughs> it's 25 centimeters long, so it, that's why I guess it got the name SGM250, but it was a, it's a pretty decent mic, and I was pretty happy with it, and... They sent me another system. In fact, I don't have it here with me right now, but it's a less expensive digital wireless lavalier system called Pro XD. Let me see if I can just pull that up here real quick. Okay. I'll share my screen here with you in just a second. Let me get it pulled up. There we go. Share that. Okay. 
There it is. Okay, so here is their Pro XD digital wireless lavalier microphone system. Some people have been asking, hey, you know, the Sennheiser kits are too expensive for what my, you know, for what my budget will allow. Um, even the road link is a little bit of a stretch if they need two of them, or even if they need one of them, it's $400 per kit. So that can be a little stretch depending again on what your budget is. This one is runs about $200 for the transceiver, or sorry, the transmitter, the receiver, and the lavalier microphone. I haven't tested out the audio quality yet, so I'm still going to do that, and uh, I think there'll be a fair bit of interest in this. But this one can do a couple of things that are kind of interesting. Um, there are a couple of um, I guess considerations when you're buying a piece of kit like this, it's $200. There are going to be some sacrifices. The first sacrifice I can tell you is that um, they have these bigger antennas. The build quality is all very plasticky, um, and it's not the highest grade plastic I've ever used. Um, they have inbuilt lithium ion batteries, I believe, which is actually surprising to me. Um, but I don't believe they're user replaceable. So they're in there and they're in there for good. <laughs> um, and then you charge it with a USB cable, which is fine. The lavalier microphone is really big, um, so it's not going to be an easy one to hide. And then it comes with a 3.5 millimeter cable that comes out of the receiver and goes either into your camera or into an audio recorder. And it also comes with an adapter that allows you to take that 3.5 millimeter cable into your mobile phone. So it looks like a kind of an interesting thing. And Asden, like I said, I, I uh, reviewed that other shotgun mic. I was pretty impressed with it. So they asked if I would take a look at this. And so we'll have a review on that in a few weeks if you're interested. I just thought I'd let, let you know that's coming up as well. All right. Stop sharing that. I also have, uh, again, I'm in the midst of the Zoom F8 uh, review. You've seen a couple of episodes on that so far. Again, just kind of sharing my impressions on that so far. I think it's it's a it's a really good recorder. I really really love it. I'm really happy that I bought it. I have no regrets putting down a thousand dollars for that. I understand it doesn't fit everyone's budget, but uh, for my for my projects, it's actually a really nice addition at this point. And um, I I would I was. Kind of my impression was it's really probably not the all-in-one solution for most pro sound location recordists because uh, the limiters are not perfect relative to, you know, like a sound devices type of piece of gear. But I've actually I'm finding that they're actually that the preamps have so much dynamic range that that's almost almost not entirely but almost a non-issue. <laughs> and I'm actually finding quite a bit of interest from pros that want to use it just as a recorder and then put a sound devices uh, mixer in front of it. And that's, you know, totally legitimate if you want to approach it that way as well. And I think a lot of pro sound mixers actually do that. So I'm actually really happy with it. And I don't even feel like I need to compensate with a sound devices in front of it. Maybe, you know, maybe someday I will still move up into a, more of one of the pro grade type recorders, but I'm really, really happy with it so far. Again, the, I think it's saving grace is its preamps are so good that I'm not running into a lot of clipping. I, t I tend to do the type of recording where, again, everything is pretty much staged. It's an interview, and uh, it's, uh, you know, people don't, they'll laugh, and that'll be the loudest we'll get. And if I leave enough headroom, I don't run into clipping issues with this, with this amplifier, these preamplifiers, because they've got enough dynamic range that it's really not a problem. So that's kind of been my experience. What about you, Christian? What's been your experience with the F8 so far? Because I think you bought one, right? Oh. Uh oh. Fascinating. I I didn't I missed that. So nice find there. I'll take a look for sure. That that would be uh, an interesting little addition. Yeah. I guess the only concern I have is. 
um, you're using the bandwidth to between you know Bluetooth between the two devices to send you know the, the levels and uh, the control information about where you put the fader. Um, if you're sending audio too, I wonder if that potentially leads to any latency or potential issues there. I don't know, but that's that's definitely something worth checking out. That'd be interesting. Yeah. I'll... I think it works okay. I think you the Bluetooth range is going to be the biggest concern. So you want, you probably want to stay <laughs> you want to do some tests to see how far you can get away from that before you start uh, running into issues there, especially if you're going to be actively mixing on the iPad. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good sign. That's a sign of a good preamp is if it's got uh, you know a little bit more dynamic range. That's the interesting thing, you know. I always found with the Taz cams, you know, dr 60 d as much as I really like this, is a nice, you know, kind of entry level XLR based audio recorder, and it is great. Don't get me wrong, um, but I don't think its preamps can handle those types of situations quite as well. If you're going from really quiet whispers to yelling <laughs> within the same scene, you're going to run into more issues on a less expensive, less uh, lower quality, lower dynamic range type of preamp. So it's great to hear. Yeah, cool. Thank you. All right. Suresh uh, Sudhakaran, I don't, and again, I apologize if I said your name wrong, but uh, welcome to our session here. You say it's 8 in the morning and yeah, <laughs> where you're out. That's <laughs> uh, Hopefully that time works okay for you. So thanks for joining. If you do have a question, be feel free to submit that here. We'd love to... Uh, We'd love to see what we can do to help you out if you do have a question. Let's see, where were we? So we talked about uh, some things coming up. Uh, we do have a few more minutes here. Let's see, what else um, did we want to talk about? I think um, if we can go back to... Let's talk for a minute. I've had this question actually come up quite a bit over the last little bit, and that is, what's the difference between gain and a fader? Um, and let me uh, let me ex try and explain the difference. It hopefully it makes sense. I think it, and that becomes an important distinction to make. If you have or are experienced with the Tascam DR60D again, the the nice thing about this is it actually operates in this way. So you actually go into the menu to set the gain, and the gain is the amount of amplification that the preamplifier does. It takes that microphone level signal and amplifies it up to a line level signal. And so you have to kind of tune that first. You only really get four settings in the TASCAM. You get uh, low, mid, high, and high plus. So those are your only options. Then on the front here, you have these little potentiometers or pots or, so, you know, for the layman, knobs <laughs> or dials. And what these are, these are faders, and what that means is that you actually, you leave the gain setting where it is, but then you use the fader to attenuate the amount of amplification that the, or actually it's the output. You just take that signal, it amplifies it to a certain level, and then on the output you can actually attenuate the output signal a little bit. So that's the distinction between the fader and a gain setting and that, that could take different forms on different types of recorders. But the important thing to consider is that when you're setting up your gain, that's where you have to be really careful to make sure you get to a point where you're not going to run into clipping. And um, that's why it's so important to have, if you, 
if you're doing a really critical shoot, uh, pros will typically get these recorders that will have a limiter in the analog stage, in the pre-amplifier stage. And the, the reason they do that is that once they set the gain and say something just goes crazy and they don't have time to react on their mixer, they don't, uh, well, they, you know, there's nothing they could do at that point. If the gain is set where it was set, if somebody yells so loud that the, um, the preamplifier starts distorting, then that damage has already been done. Then that distorted signal goes to the analog to digital converter, then it gets recorded. There's no coming, there's no, there are some things you can do <laughs> if it's mild, but they can kind of reconstruct some of those waveforms if it's mild distortion. But if it gets to be heavy distortion, game's over. So you just you've just captured distorted audio and there's nothing really you can do there. However, in those higher end recorders, they will have analog limiters that will actually take that signal as it's coming into the preamplifier. And if it's too loud, it'll actually limit it and pull it back down before it gets to the analog to digital converter and convert it to digital. So it saves the audio. So that's the, that's the tack that sound devices usually takes on their recorders. Zaxcom takes a kind of different approach. What Zaxcom does is their recorders, like the Max or the Nomad, will actually allow, they have, what they've done essentially is they've into their analog to digital converter, they've built way more dynamic range than any other recorder really does. So whereas the Zoom F8, which has what I would consider a very nice wide dynamic range, it's spec'd at 120 dB dynamic range. The sound devices, most of those recorders and mixers are somewhere in the 116 to 18 dB range. And then the Zaxcom, for comparison, actually are spec'd at 137 dB. So they have a little bit more kind of built-in headroom to handle more dynamic range going between whispers all the way up to yells and screams and things of that nature. So instead of, instead of implementing a, an analog limiter, they actually just created an analog to digital converter that can, it's actually technically two analog to digital converters so it can manage a much wider dynamic range and avoid clipping. And in fact, they call that feature never clip. So uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, view of, of the different approaches that these different companies are taking to manage a, a, an inherent problem with digital recording. So just a little thought there. Um, let's see, Sarish has a question here. Sure, what's the best shotgun mic for extreme noise isolation like traffic noise? Well, there's never a best of anything, I don't think. <laughs> Every tool is kind of better suited for a different job. If you want extreme noise isolation, the uh, one of the tools you'll probably want to look at is a long shotgun microphone. Now, those aren't cheap. And in fact, let's just take a look here. Let's pull up, I'm just going to share my screen with you again here. And let's go over to, I know Rode has one, so let's go to Rode Mics. Their products, they have microphones for video. And you can see they have their NTG line here. So many of you are familiar, NTG 1, 2, 3, 4, and 4 plus. They also have this long shotgun microphone called the NTG 8. Now, the NTG-8 is much larger than all of those other microphones. You can see here this interference tube is huge. <laughs> and this thing sticks way out. And in fact, if we look at the specs, uh, let's see, does it tell us? 559 millimeters, so 50, almost 56 centimeters long. And again, a short shotgun mic is typically about 28 centimeters long. So you can see this is almost twice the size of a typical short shotgun microphone. And what that does is it, it, it provides a very, very tight pickup pattern. So let me just uh, sh try and illustrate something here. So on a normal, like an NTG4 shotgun microphone, if you have the microphone within say 60 centimeters of the talent, the pickup pattern is gonna be about like this. You know, as it hits the person, it's gonna be, it's gonna be about that wide. On the NTG-8, it's going to be much narrower. It's only going to be about that wide. So it is going to be better at isolating. Um, but it comes at a cost. It's difficult to get that aim just right. And if you're off a little bit on your aim, you're not going to get your sound source. You're going to get something else. So <laughs> the, 
that's probably the most extreme example, Sarish, of, of a really isolating type of microphone to consider. Um, so if you're going to be shooting in really noisy traffic, that's one thing to consider. However, I would encourage you to, if there's any way you can borrow or rent another a short shotgun microphone and use that outdoors where you're going to be shooting in traffic just as a test, I think you'll be surprised at how well those do. If if you mount the microphone up above, pointed down at the talent, and again, keep it within 60 centimeters, preferably, if you can, get it into 48 centimeters. So that's going to require some pretty tight framing as far as the filming is concerned. But um, if you can get it in that close, you can do a really, really nice job of isolating the talent's dialogue from all of the traffic. That's, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> so you're in India, and traffic noise is hell. Totally, totally understand. So. That's one thing to consider is a longer shotgun mic. Rode makes one. I don't have personal experience with that one, but I know Rode makes some pretty good quality products. I've, I own several of them and been very happy with them. And uh, that's, that is one option out there. So definitely something to look at if you are running into a lot of issues with traffic noise and need to isolate that. So good question. Thanks for that one, Sarish. All right, we have just a couple more minutes left. If any of you that are viewing have questions, happy to have you submit those, and we'll take a look at those. Uh, let's see, where was I? What was I talking about before? Uh, I think we were talking about... Oh, yeah, we were talking about limiters. Okay. Oh, okay, Sarish has a follow-up here. I have an ME66. I'm looking for a really high-end shotgun, but it's hard to buy something without knowing the differences. I... Yeah, I completely understand that. Um, I believe, so you have a Sennheiser right now. Um, the ME66 is, again, it's a short shotgun microphone, so that's going to be the same thing you would get with any of the, the Rode microphones. Again, it's not quite as isolating. The pickup pattern is a little bit larger. Um, if you're already working in within 60 centimeters of your talent, boom from above, pointed down at their mouth, and you're still getting too much traffic noise, then yeah, it's definitely time to have a look at a, at a long shotgun microphone. And um, I'm not, again, I'm, I must confess, I'm not that familiar with them. I, I know about the NTGA, I've never used it. I believe Sankin is another company that has a very nice, um, let's see if we can find it here for you real quick. They make a lot of really nice uh, microphones that a lot of the pros will use. And they have here are their lavalier microphones, rear rejection stereo wide, stereo mono. I think it's the, I think it's a CS3E. I'm not, no, that's a short shotgun. And I may be wrong. They may not have a long shotgun. I just don't know. Um, but this one, I can say that the CS, the, the Sankin shotgun mics, uh, the 3E at least, I know this one has a tighter pickup pattern than most others, and in fact, if we pull that up here, the nice thing about it is, um, I don't know if you can, can you see this? Yeah, you can see it. The way this works is, so if this is on axis, this is, you know, the, the mouth of the talent that's speaking is going to be over here, and this is where it's most sensitive, and you can see as you move off to the side, it falls off. The CS3E has kind of a unique pickup pattern relative to other shotgun mics. A lot of the other shotgun mics have these really long tails on the back. So what that means in practical terms is that anything behind the microphone also gets picked up. Um, but the CS3E doesn't appear to have as much of a prominent uh, tail here on the back, with the exception of this frequency here, 16,000 kilohertz. So the really high frequency does pick up some of that. But a lot of the lower frequencies it won't pick up that stuff from the back of the microphone. So that is an example of a short shotgun mic with a pickup pattern that's a little bit more isolating. Um, they're not cheap. This one, um, gosh, I don't know how much it is. Let's take a look. I have Sankin CS3. $1,450 US, so it's not a cheap microphone by any means, um, but that is an option. Oh, there is, oh, if you're going really high end, one other thing to consider, let me just show you this while we're here. Uh, Sheps does make CMIT to you. Uh-oh, looks like B&H is having an issue. See if we can find it now. 
super CNIT. There it is. It's a very expensive microphone. <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit about it. So this one is over $4,000 US. Um, you did say you're going uh, high end, so I don't know if this is too high end. But here's the idea. This one actually, is, it's worth getting online and doing a Google search for it to find some audio samples. But this actually does some digital attenuation as well. It's a very interesting microphone. Um, it actually has this, again, a digital signal processing that actually reduces a lot of the ambient noise and just captures exactly what you're trying to capture. So it's a very different microphone than most other shotguns. It is still a short shotgun microphone, but again, they're doing something in digital processing that helps to eliminate a lot of that ambient noise. So um, if I, I, it's a it's an expensive one <laughs> for sure, but it's a very interesting one, and we're starting to see more of those in use. Um, I don't know very many people that own these. In fact, I don't know anyone personally that owns these, but I think they are available at a lot of the sound rental houses. Um, so if you do have a particular need for one, it is something you could potentially rent and give that a try. So again, good questions. Uh, thank you, Suresh, for that one. Hope that was helpful for you. We have come to the end of our time for tonight. I want to thank everyone for checking in for your questions, and uh, Christian also for your update, and Bob earlier for your update as well. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll talk to you guys again soon.